Hello again and welcome back to the fourth lecture on measuring stress and strain in the geodynamics course. In this lecture we're going to be focusing on normal and shear strains, defining what we mean by normal and shear strains in a bit more detail than in the previous lectures. We have two goals for this lecture. First we want to present the mathematical definitions of normal and shear strains and how they're calculated. And then we'll make the distinction between pure and simple shear, which are terms you might have heard if you've taken a structural geology course. So we'll start with our picture of normal strains in two dimensions. It's a bit of a complicated diagram here out of the Turcotte and Schubert textbook, but um, we'll kind of step our way through this. If you'd like, you're welcome to also pause the video at this point, take a look at the picture and kind of get yourself oriented before continuing on in the lecture. But we're going to start by calculating our displacements of each corner of this rectangle, P, Q, R, S, the letters simply representing each corner of the rectangle. Displacements represented by the letter W, and the displacement that we're going to calculate is the displacement from its initial position, for instance, P, to a final position, P prime. So for that corner, P, we can see that the displacement along the x-axis would simply be the change from its initial position x to its final position x prime. And the same thing could be said for the y-axis here that we start at position y and we move to position y prime. And of course you can go around the rectangle and do all four corners the same way. If you're curious about why this is a minus sign here, it has to do with our convention that uh, when we're shortening or reducing the length of something, that's going to be a positive strain. And so you'll see that if we had negative values here for the displacement, that would be giving us positive values for the strain. So of course, yes, you can calculate the same thing for all four corners. And if you go through this and do a little bit of mathematical rearrangement, you come up with normal strain components epsilon xx and epsilon yy that look like this, where epsilon xx is simply dx minus dx prime divided by dx. So again, it's something that's of the form the change in length divided by the original length. Or if you prefer, you can put this in terms of the displacements and have dwx divided by dx. Of course, you can say exactly the same thing along the y-axis. And if you're curious about this, the Turcotte and Schubert textbook goes through the full derivation of how to do this calculation. Okay, so now if we move on to shear strains, we could talk about something a little bit different. Previously, we had looked at an example where the angles of the different sides of this rectangle hadn't changed. They might have had a lengthening or shortening of one of the sides, but there was no change in angle. And changes in angles in materials, of course, will happen when they undergo shear strain. And so, in this case, we're looking again at a rectangle P, Q, R, S. And you can see here its initial form is rectangular and its final form looks more like a parallelogram where these dashed lines trace out the deformed shape. The shear strain in this case would be epsilon x, y, for example is equal to one half of the change in the angle SPQ. So you could see here the angle SPQ initially is a 90 degree angle and then after deformation it is a angle that is less than 90 degrees. And so if we take phi 1 and phi 2 to be the change in angle along each of the two sides there, then you could calculate your shear strain as simply one half phi one plus phi two. And here just worthwhile to note that epsilon xy is going to be negative when this angle decreases like it has here. If you were to go through and do this just for the sake of the mathematical exercise, you can do exactly the same kind of calculation we did before with displacements of the corners and you can show yourself that epsilon xy can also be shown to be equal to one half dwy dx plus dwx 
dy. And the Turcotte and Schubert book, again, goes through the full um, derivation of that calculation. If you're curious about where it comes from, I'm just putting it here for the sake of completeness. When we talk about shear strain, you can divide shear strain into two different kind of simple end member types. The first is what's pictured up above, and that is called pure shear. And in this case, you can see that both sides of this reference rectangle are rotate, rotated equally as the result of shear strain. And in other words, phi 1 is equal to phi 2 in this case, so the rotation from the original horizontal line here to its final position is equal to the same rotation that takes place between the vertical line and this inclined dashed line here. And you can see then the geometry takes on something like uh, what's dashed out here. So that's a case where we have pure shear where phi 1 and phi 2 are equal. Simple shear occurs when one of the two angles, either phi 1 or phi 2, uh, is equal to 0. And um, simple shear is what's pictured down here in the lower figure out of the Turcotte and Schubert textbook. Here you can see there's two angles phi 2 that are equal to one another. And what was initially a rectangular shape has just been sort of sheared over in a simple way. The way that I tend to think about simple shear is if you took a deck of cards and you had them stacked between your hands and you move your hands like this, what you would see is that the cards would simply shear over and you would still have two of your hands being parallel, the top card and the bottom card of the deck of cards. If you don't shear them too far apart, will still remain parallel to one another, but you'll notice that the shape of the deck of cards in profile has changed because you've sheared it. Now that's typically what I think about when I think about simple shear. When rocks undergo simple shear, um, we can describe the rotation that takes place or the, the deformation that takes place as a combination of shear and solid body rotation, and the Turcotte and Schubert book gives you the mathematics behind how you get to this calculation of solid body rotation. Again, I'm just putting it in here to be complete, but if we want to, we could look at the solid, solid body rotation, the Z component of solid body rotation. Uh, this is the Greek letter omega, not a W, so it's a lowercase omega. Z is equal to one half, or, sorry, minus one half phi 1 minus phi 2, or it's equal to the same as we could do the calculation for pure shear, one half of dwy dx minus dwx dy. And so again, that's just a, um, a way of calculating the combination of um, deformation types that are occurring in the case of simple shear. Okay, so that was a little bit uh, heavy on the math and not so many simple examples, but uh, you can go ahead now at this point and take the quiz and we'll come back in the next lecture and look in a little bit more detail at different types of strain measurements.